Hi, I'm Jim Clark, Visual Arts Manager here at Hopkins Center for the Arts. We're speaking with Peg Carlson Hoffman and Chuck Hoffman about their exhibition At the Edges of Wilderness, on view now through June 17th, 2023. Peg, Chuck, welcome. Thanks oh, it's great us. to be here. Thanks. Thanks for everybody else. We are enjoying your exhibition. Um, it is my understanding, um, and we, we spoke about this a little bit, that you work collaboratively on the same work at the same time. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that process, how that works, and how you came up with this approach? Or why we would even do yeah. anything yeah. like that? Yeah. I, I didn't want to step in that quite yet, oh, no. but well, I couldn't imagine doing it, say, yeah. with my wife. We'll bring, right. we'll bring you into our world here. Yeah, so. our world. Go ahead, Chuck, you could start with this one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, back in the mid 2000s, we were very involved with Belfast, Northern Ireland. And we were going there and seeing how we might use art uh, as a pathway to reconciliation. So we worked closely with the communities on both sides of the conflict and we got a commission. So the, <sighs> It was a, pretty a triptych that we were supposed to paint. It was pretty interesting two be weeks. because it was um, commissioned by a secular non-for-profit. It was paid for by Catholic nuns, and it was hanging in the narthex of a Protestant gathering space. Wow. So we thought, wow. And we only had two weeks of vacation. It right. was very large. It was women studying their common history. Yeah, and they've been doing that for almost a year. Yes, and we were to make a manifestation of this wonderful uh, cooperation that they had with each other, but we couldn't do it ahead of time because we had to hear their stories. So we listened to stories for several days and then wondered how we were going to get well, this done. How we were going to get it done. <laughs> but we, and yeah. We decided to do it together. Yeah, so we kind of pulled our creative thinking together and we found over the course of two weeks of painting that something new rose from that, that it was not just my art or not just your art, but something new had risen. And you set ego aside and you set all the things that you bring as humans to something. And we found that the art um, truly was one of the things that we were trying to talk about with <laughs> reconciliation or pathways and that creativity has a way to move us forward. Um, so on the flight home, we said, let's give this a chance in the studio and see. That was pretty amazing, don't you think? And, and prior to that, uh, you were, had separate yeah. uh, practices. Yeah, tw yeah totally. we, tw almost 20 years, we both worked on our own work on yeah. opposite sides of the studio. So it was a big change, a big change yeah. for sure. So we said, let's give it six months and we'll see how it goes. And we've been doing it since 2007. So I think... You know, there, it's fraught with a lot of stuff, too. I mean, it's a lot of debate, sometimes arguments. Sometimes we just know that we have to step away from a piece because we are just not in agreement. In fact, we had a piece once that we could not agree on the name. Yeah, so when we displayed it at an titles. exhibition, we had two titles, two write-ups. And we couldn't. <laughs> but amazing. I think we continue to do that because we're of the belief that... Um, that sort of conversation and dialogue between us lets something else rise and hopefully connects with other people in a universal sort of way. Um, we are non-representational because we like people to kind of come into the story and continue that story from their own experience, whether you like the piece or don't like the piece, but maybe it's just some nugget that draws you in that you can have a dialogue and a conversation. So. Well, I think the other interesting thing for me is that our paintings are not a compromise. Mm -hmm. We don't, we not, we don't, it's, it's a strange thing when you're uh, sitting on each side of the fence and you have to come together. It's sort of like atoms making a new molecule. Like nothing happens unless you get closer. So um, the closer we get, the more opportunity is for something completely different 
uh, to rise, and that's always the surprise. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and there's lots of faux pas. And, yeah, it doesn't and always that, go that smoothly. No, <laughs> yeah, we have plenty, lots of those stories. I would imagine um, yeah. it couldn't help but bring you closer together. Is that is that true? Is it fair to say? I think yeah, I think it's fair to say. But the pathway to get there is certainly not a direct route. Sure. Right, because there's a lot of debate and there's a lot of, um, I don't know, ego that comes in or, yeah. hey, I'm, you know, one of our classic stories we talk about, we were working on a piece, it was a commission piece, it was for two writers. And we liked the idea that there is light that illuminates their, these writers' words. And so we had a deep blue canvas with this sliver of light that, that cut through it. And then out of that comes small characters designed um, that there are birthing words into the world. Sounds pretty innocent enough. But then I made the horrible mistake as Peg it was, was doing a horrible that, mistake. that lettering. <laughs> I uh, took a brush and said, you know, I just don't think this is working. I'm and like, That was a bad mistake wow. on my part that <laughs> So there is more to it in that he painted <laughs> all of it out. And then I said, you just painted out everything I just put in. And to which he said, oh, well, honey, it's still there. It's underneath the paint. <laughs> and I'm like, like that was some sort of consolation to me. Um, but actually, yeah. Chuck, it was the right thing to paint over th that. You know, I was probably taking over the canvas. And, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons sure. to, like, if you get, one person is getting too bossy on a canvas, there's a lot of reasons to go back in and yeah. try to duke it out, so. Well, it's a, it's a, it, it turned out really nice. Yeah, it was great yeah. when it was done. How do you yeah. even start? Is, is it conceptual? Is there, do you, do you write out uh, things or uh, are there, Preparatory drawings. What what does that look like to start? Uh, yes and yes and yes. We yes, usually nice. have start with a theme. Okay. And it usually comes out of our experience. So after we um, went to uh, Palestine and Israel, and worked with our art there, we painted about that experience. And so it's an experience, process, and process is the mm -hmm. painting. And even with this exhibition came out of, we lived six years in the wilderness uh, up in the Cascade Mountains. We were directors at a retreat center and we experienced um, one of the largest forest fires that year uh, in 2015. So we, as we processed that event and our time living in the wilderness, it profoundly changed us and how we view the world and um, even to where we live right now. But like the wood panels are salvaged from uh, wood from that fire. Yeah, trees. And so we wanted to paint on those things to kind of re rebirth them in a way. Um, so we paint from that experience. So we do a lot of sketching. We do a lot of, um, oh, color studies. And, 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 and sometimes they just get tossed aside. I don't think we take a very linear path to what we're doing. It's very circuitous. And... Um, sometimes other inspirations come and add to that. Um, we we're talking to the Steens here, even on the painting here, um, there's like 25 paintings <laughs> underneath that. I mean, just because it's always changing. So we begin maybe with a sketch or an idea, a theme, our experiences, what do we need? What, we like the idea that paintings connect through, with people and through time and that they are little markers along the way of our experience, but maybe your experiences too, and those art can trigger conversation around that. But it doesn't always present itself as a linear solution. So I don't think we go directly from a sketch to a finish. We begin somewhere and then the painting begins to talk back with us. Yeah, and I would say we never just come to a blank canvas and say, oh geez, let's see what happens today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because that would be like a recipe for disaster for yeah. us. Cause we would, either, each one of us would try to take over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we, we, I'm sure of it. <laughs> yeah, and we play a lot um, too. Like we just put out a big sheet of uh, four by eight paper and divide it up into 
squares or whatever, which we tend to work in a lot. And we're using tempera paint. So it, like, it doesn't have all the, I have to make a painting, or I have something for an exhibition, or I have something that I want to show. Yeah. We don't care. We're sure. just, we're playing. So we both even work on that together yeah. as well. So. Well, and relatedly, I, a lot of folks here um, in the audience are artists themselves. And um, many folks uh, struggle and wrestle with that empty canvas kind of uh, um, illness, right? The, 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 the great responsibility that something wonderful needs to happen on this because, you know, it's a great big expanse. And that's something, I mean, you can pick up a canvas for 16 bucks over at Michael's or whatever, right? These wood panels, you have a finite amount of those grounds, those surfaces, I mean, once you're out of those, is there an added sense of um, responsibility and, and kind of, of that weight of something great needs to happen on this? Or do you work that out? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. Or when is something done, right? That's yeah. the other question we wrestle with. But we have a couple things that we do that sometimes work, sometimes doesn't. Well, on yeah. our canvases, well, in all of our paintings, we always, before we begin, we write uh, an intention, mm -hmm. uh, hope, uh, prayer, if you will, something uh, that, and, and then we just hold that into the Right yeah. onto the surface. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, so we, the, onto the raw canvas and the raw materials, we write. Because that, it's our first that step. breaks the anxiety for, for us. Plus, it, it adds, gosh, what are we thinking about? What is going on in the world? What are our hopes for this painting, for it to go into the world, or for the people who will hang it, or or for a show like this. Yeah. So we break, we break that barrier with some kind of writing or a poem that goes right on the canvas and then just so. We also do, a, <clears throat> we develop uh, while in Northern Ireland working with groups, um, divided groups. We took what we learned painting together and developed an exercise that people paint around the table with us. And you have a color and you move the color one way, you move the next way. So you're now interacting and the language becomes the art itself, right? It's the line that the person before you left and now I interact with that language. Um, but the way we break the plane with people who are not accustomed to creating is to just take that dot, talk about being a kid again and putting that dot on the paper. And so now you've begun, you've broken, you've broken the plane of that, so. Wow. Sometimes it works and sometimes it, you know, you just have to wait until, or just start working too. I don't know that inspiration ever really works. <laughs> sure. I mean, there are elements that yeah. come, but I think if you wait for it, you'll be waiting forever. Totally. Um, the in process while you're working together, is a lot of your communication verbal or a verbal? How would you? Well, we used to have a no talking rule. Yeah. We had rules. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we definitely have a, nobody's allowed to paint while the other person is in the bathroom. <laughs> so, Has that rule ever been broken? Yes. <laughs> Once. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you almost have to, I mean, it's so tempting. Like, Chuck will step out of the room that. and I can think of an, about nine things that I want to do to that painting. Yeah. I mean, you relate. As artists, you, can, you, you, you think of all these things and the compromises that you make and um, the willingness to let something else rise is really hard to do. So I, uh, yes, I, I, I went in there with my brush. And he knew it, you he knew, knew it. it. Yeah, he knew yeah. It. yeah. So. But I think, I think you're both and. I think, like once we get into, like I think in our, our artist statement, we talk about reaching the point where we just get to the place of creative bliss and we're working comfortably with one another 
And it's really quite amazing when it does reach that point and you lose track of time. Mm -hmm. You have no idea what day it is sometimes, right? Um, but I think that that nonverbal stuff is really uh, important to just let it flow. I think if there's trust and you just allow that to come out and we'll correct it later, or maybe that doesn't work, but the painting begins to interact with you too. And then I think when you step back from it, we'll take pauses and then the critique comes. I don't understand what you're trying to do there. What are, what are, what are we after right now? And so I think it's, it's sort of both and. Yeah, and, I, and, be, and a lot of times before we begin again for the day, we'll kind of say, are we going where we had hoped we would go? And we do have, yeah. so we do, we probably do more talking now than we used to. And I would just add too, like when we work, we don't have, one of the things that's helped us is that we don't put a painting up on the easel and that's it because it oh, becomes right. a block sure. where we could have 10 or 15 oh, yeah. things going on at the same time because, oh man, I don't know where this one's going. Yeah. So we'll move to someplace else. And a lot of times that may inform what's going on here. And we, fortunately we have a studio so we can leave things up and we can come back in and those images are still there. Now we're, we're different people when we walk in the next day, right? We've experienced other things that now come to that canvas, but at least we've got multiple things happening that we don't put the pressure of, we have to make this. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, I think that helps too. Hmm. Do you, are you 100% into the collaborative process at this point? Do you, do you each maintain individual uh, practice at all or yeah oh I we definitely we definitely yeah. do yeah. um sketch we have sketchbooks and drawings and we're you know i do some fabric things and chuck does some yeah, sketches a lot of charcoal and, and so we and photography we, and and, and we stuff. do uh still have a practice for a while we didn't do much mm -hmm. but um we we have a little more time than we had before when we were working all day yeah. so and then I think it informs I think it's it's healthy too because our influence that I'll see and I'll begin to express in a sketchbook that could end up hey I want to show you this yeah. or she'll say I've looked at this what do you think about this so, I mean I think it ultimately comes back to sort of collaboration but there are things that we are doing um, to kind of keep our own voices going. Yeah, I, so. I called that up the arm, down the arm. So whether it was, we both had creative careers. So some of the things that went up our arm at work came out our arm in our personal work. And some of our personal work went up this arm and came out in our work. And that is also true for our daily practice of mm -hmm. um, sketchbooks and I guess I call it, we call it sort of snarfing around in the studio, kind of not a non-agenda work, which sure. is really important. Yeah, and stuff to get, like I have, I do a thing that um, I think I've done, how do I feel today through color every day since January, I mm -hmm. think. And that kind of keeps me in a rhythm of doing it. Like I have to get out there to put, you know, well, how do I feel today? So it's a very simple act of just making and being in the studio, even when you're I'm not sure today is a good day to create, but mindful kind of and aesthetic, yeah. mindful and aesthetic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of that rhythm to, to go back just a, a moment, because you'd spoken of the period in process where you, you got a flow going, you lose track of time, things clicking. How, could you say about how much proportionally, how much of the time, how much of studio time is that magic time? Hmm. Wow, that's really. Mm. And maybe it's not possible. No, no. it. No, uh, I'm kind of trying to. I will. I would say, gosh. When we have lots of things going on in our studio, and our studio itself is a sacred place, so when we walk into that space. Mm -hmm there's already a shift. Yeah, we've, we've worked, like we've worked in studios, we've worked in our bedrooms, we've worked on our kitchen table, but there is something about having a space for your art to make your art. Mm 
yeah. and um, that's sacred. And so walking into that already sets us up for a shift. And then um, actually doing the work, actually picking up, like I'm not in any kind of bliss when I'm dragging out the paintbrushes and trying to remember what colors I used yesterday. But um, once it's actually when we're working, I would say it takes us probably 10 or 15 minutes, wouldn't you say, to click in? Yeah. And like I said, we're, we're fortunate to have a studio. And that was criteria when we moved here. And there is something about crossing that threshold because it's separate from our house. But to cross that threshold into the creative, our sacred space. And there's something that happens. I can't explain it. I think maybe it's the more creative energy and the more hospitality we have our own shows there, we bring people in, we do workshops there, that there's a lot of creative energy that I think is in those walls. So when you come out and you enter into it, for us, it's like it shifts that. Maybe it's like going to your bedroom and it's time for sleep, right? Or a kitchen, it's time to eat. You go out there to the studio and it's time to make whatever that looks like. So... But it's, I think it's something that you also build on that, that energy and the people that you invite in and offer hospitality to and, and to create along with you too, I think sure. is important. This show, the theme is related to wilderness. Uh, and um, you've said that the work is non-representational. It flirts, I think, at times with representation in a, in a pleasing way and, and people find, um, that fluid threshold between what, what they see and what you intended, and it's a, a beautiful, ambiguous space. Um, but some of your pro process and practice is involved with very um, social-oriented, the reconciliation acts and whatnot. I mean, those are very social. And I love the wilderness. Um, I personally, think of and use the wilderness as an asocial place. Um, do you think there's a friction there or do you see it differently? Do you see wilderness and social um, content and activities as being maybe less disparate than I do? Hmm. I, for me, I'll answer that. Um, just for me, you probably have a different maybe idea. But especially the on the, wilder the wilderness that where we live, there was a village, it's called Holden Village. And it is literally in the middle of the national wilderness, um, right on the boundary. So edges and boundaries are a place that Chuck and I go for inspiration. And it's our Everything, everything is about edges and boundaries, it seems like it was either. It was Catholics and Protestants, it was, you know, Palestinians and Israelis, it was it, every time, it figures we live right on the boundary between Minnesota and yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, and the, that's a happening place, that, those edges and boundaries. Mm -hmm. And that's where change happens. And so just like Chuck and I have edges and boundaries when we paint together, edges and boundaries in our experience is a huge thing. So whether it's people coming together to, to make something that they couldn't make by themselves, or whether it's a lived experience or just even a little slice of landscape. Mm -hmm. So edges and boundaries are big, would yeah. you say? Yeah, and that's, that's a, actually a really good question. And we lived in uh, downtown Kansas City in a loft in the urban core of Kansas City before we moved to the wilderness. So our uh, move was extreme. Yeah. So we get the social aspect of a vibrant town to um, living in 300 inches of snow, sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, um, so I think, there, I think there's both end from our experience because of the village and what we were running out there. There was that aspect of social community, you know, it was very education focused. So we had people that would come and talk about the issues of the day. So there was that sort of thing happening, but I could also put my backpack on and I could head out on a solitary walk 
which to me was rejuvenating. Um, I think to be amongst the trees and nature changed my perspective of the world. Mm. And um, I don't think we have enough of that or time to spend there because I think there's something about that wilderness that's restorative as well as healing. So it's not quite an answer, but it's sort of both and. Um, so I think the ability to like move between them, because certainly if your studio is in an urban core, has a lot to draw from energy wise. And I also think if you're in the wilderness or in a place where there is less about people and more about you know, a John okay. Muir world, I mean, there's something that informs that as well and connects. And I think I found over the years that that really connects for me and inspires me. So, so we beautifully danced around your question. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Question. I'm fascinated by your comment that when you walk in in the morning, you're a different person than you were when you walked out. Mm -hmm. And the question I have is, how much, if any, do you tap back into the other people you have been hmm. before you walked in mm -hmm. to harvest something that was visible to them mm -hmm. that may not be visible to you as you're standing there on this day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah I think too. Yeah, no, that's a really good question because I, I think there's a part of me that uh, I hover around the wor word impermanence, that nothing is permanent, we are constantly changing. You will be changed after you leave today. You're probably different now than you were yesterday. And I think that's my reference point for that, that there's no way that I can be that exact same person that I was yesterday. I think there is an ability to tap into because certainly the work that I've started or the work that we have started or whatever we're doing draws us back because we can be drawn back to those conversations Right, and I think the inspirations that we were dealing with. But I'm also mindful that it's like that impermanence is okay too, that I am ch constantly changing and that we're not static. The world is not static. The world is always changing, so. Yeah, thanks. Ah, the person, I probably, Chuck is, Chuck is, probably more aware of being different every day than I, my, my timeline is a little, I'm, I, I don't always feel different or I don't even think about being different every day. I'm aware of, I'm a lot different than when I started the painting, but on a, on a daily basis, I probably, I probably come dashing out to the studio, start looking. I mean, I, I'm probably a little bit more, um, I'm, prob I'm probably not as mindful of as you are. I'm not as mindful That's of That's why we're a good combo. As, <laughs> <laughs> I'd spin off the planet and whatever. You no, know, you, would, you would just, yeah, you would still be meditating and I would be throwing paint at you, right. so it's all right, yeah. <laughs> You're working on a painting that's on an easel. Mm -hmm. Do you both have brushes on the painting at the same time from different sides? Yeah. Okay. And, and we move around. And you move yeah. around. Mm -hmm. And then as far as a palette, if you don't have your, do you work from the same palette, you know, because of your? Yeah. Yes, we definitely work from the same palette. Do, do yeah. The colors. yeah. We actually had someone photograph it because they were like, what? Um, and that's on our website, but there we do. Like once we're kind of into a palette, we stick with a palette. I'm not, she's not saying I want to work with red and I want to work with green. I mean, we truly come into a place where we're, we talk through it. It's like, oh yeah, that's a beautiful color. Let's work with that. Or, well, but then there's also, uh, I'll look over and it's in the palette, but Chuck is like putting more yellow. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, it happens. I mean, this is really what I'm thinking. So you are actually holding your own physical palette to dip your brush? No, no. we, okay. we share, we share one okay. in, in between us. But, you know, uh, he's like squeezing out some more. Yeah, I'm thinking, really? Well, we have those to face. Yellow. It's I mean, like, perfect but science. I, don't, yeah. I don't say, I'm thinking, yeah. really, more yellow? Really? Mm -hmm. And I, I trust 
that Chuck is, knows what he's doing. <laughs> there is the flaw. No. <laughs> No, no, but I, I mean, I actually mean that. Yeah. Like I trust, we trust Chuck each other to have an I to have a good hold on what he's trying to do. So I, it's a lot easier to give up some of that ego stuff or bossiness and trying mm -hmm. to take over the painting if you are um, trusting that this person knows what they're doing. Yeah. And. So I may think, really, yellow? And then after a while, I go, oh, yeah, really, yellow. So that happens a lot. And sometimes we're on that path, too. And it's like, I know we've said a million times, it's like, you can't think your way into this. You just got to try it. You just, let's just see what happens with this. And I'm probably more in favor of risk. <laughs> but it's like, let's just see. And we've ruined stuff, too. But I think through that experimental and really trying to get at something else. Um, I don't know that because we've had debates where it's just, like, do you think we should put a burnt orange on this? Well, I don't know. Do you like burnt orange? I don't know. Do you think burnt orange? I mean, let's just try and put burnt orange on there. And if not, yeah. we work yeah. in acrylics and we'll just we'll move away from that. But if it doesn't work, so what? I mean, we, it's hard to remember that. And we tend to use really wide brushes that, yeah. not long handle brushes, but thick round, and so that Those we can short, really move little them things. about. We generally like working 48 by 48 or 40 by 40. I think there's a 30 by 30. Yeah, in there. like these weren't. These were a little bit some different. of the backgrounds were. We had to kind of get smaller with these, and that's about really about a different thing. One of the things we've worked with in here is archetypal shapes. So yeah. archetypal shapes are throughout. So um, is it okay if I, <laughs> you can cut this part out? But it's oh. like <laughs> the, arch the archetypal shapes are really important to us. And archetypal shapes are like five basic shapes that have uh, appeared in all cultures throughout all time. So the circle is one of them, the square, the triangle, the spiral, and the equilateral cross are all archetypal shapes that have similar meanings throughout time, throughout cultures. And we like working with those and using those because we feel connected to culture long before us and hopefully culture, culture ahead of us. So I think those, um, I don't know why I got down on this path. How did that happen? Because we work in but archetypal we, shapes a lot. So I think when you look at it and you Makes start sense. seeing those shapes, it's like, you know, the equilateral cross is relationship, and we're, that's a really big thing for us in reconciliation and working. Or the circle is wholeness and unity. You know, the sun, the moon, I mean, it's all about us as one. So we like exploring those things together. I don't, didn't yeah. ask you. I, I made up a, a question for you and an answer. So thank <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> I was going to ask that. Okay, good. <laughs> Any other questions? I was going to ask you what type of careers you you said you both worked in the arts before you yeah. took this on. Yeah. What type of careers did you have? Oh, I worked for um, Hallmark Cards for 21 years. And he was a, an architect, right? No. Oh, I, think, <laughs> that's, you I wanted to be an architect. I liked it. Yes, I and I like structural things. Yeah. And I worked for a number of design firms, but I worked for Disney down in Florida for six oh, years. Okay. So, imagine. And then I think what is great that, first of all, you're still married. And secondly, <laughs> I know. You, it's you, amazing. Could, you have constructive years. criticism right in your, in your studio. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to look outside that. And yeah. I think that's just marvelous. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, something for us to be grateful for to think about that. Yes that uh, somebody that can criticize, like you said, constructive criticism um, that comes from a place of caring and love as opposed to judge, judgment. <laughs> judgment. And we, judgment. Had, we have an escape clause too, so that Oh, helps. that's good. Everybody <laughs> right? should so have it's, that. So it's like, you know, we, we said, let's try this working together for six months. And if it doesn't work, it's over, no harm, no foul, we'll just go about. And so we've continued all these years but we still have that like we ask the question a lot stuff, so. don't we every right. once all every once okay. in a while i'll be like are you sure we should be painting together yeah, we, 
Why is there something wrong with our marriage? <laughs> So yeah, how right. long have you been doing this together? Since uh, 2000, when was it? 2007. 2007. Mm. So what is that? Somebody else will have to do the math <laughs> Good. on that. Long, yeah. long, long time, time now. Long time. The, the idea of collaborative art is completely new to me. Uh, would you say you're kind of unique, or do you belong to the, the Society of Collaborative Artists? <laughs> Honey, we should oh. start one. Yeah, I like that idea. No. Do you know of anybody else that does this? Yeah, well, I, every once in a while we run across potters, or uh, quite often people will pass things, they'll work on it, pass it along. Lots of artists have made experiments with that over the years. But um, this sort of sustained painting together, I, we don't know a lot of people that do it, but we also love to paint with like big groups of people. Yeah. So, I mean, there wouldn't yeah. be anything more fun to get you with paintbrushes in your hands and uh, yeah. working your way around the table to create something wonderful. Yeah, we just did a workshop this past week with a group of 14 people, and we introduced them to that notion of painting together. And it's always the interesting part is the dialogue after it's over. Because sometimes it speaks to people, and it's like, oh, yeah, we just created something together that we couldn't have created on our own. And then you can take the same statement and make it negative. <laughs> it's like, why did we do what we just did? Is that the only way to do that? And usually, like, our time in Northern Ireland was to get to things like, well, what did that feel like? You know, how did that feel to paint together? And then what can we learn from what we did? Do we know each other a little bit differently now? Does it open the dialogue where words Oh my God, words that divide us. Yeah, we're, especially artists, in a place divides. like Northern Ireland, we were looking to build bridges with people so they didn't really actually, they could use something else as a language, color, shape, and form that didn't require words. So there was a camaraderie that would develop between people that couldn't have had a conversation yeah. in the same room. So um, that's sort of how... That, so the, yeah. the society, no. No society. Um, <laughs> and we don't, we really don't know others that are doing this. There might, I'm sure there are out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is like, if it's something that we've stumbled upon, somebody else has stumbled upon it. Well, I've too. never come across it before. Yeah. He's well-traveled. And he's well-traveled. His patron. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, so, I, but I think the introduction of that is a new idea because the idea of a, a, a soul a artist struggling in, in, in our own world with that is very different than what we're trying to do. And it seems counterintuitive to what art is sometimes. But I think because we work, we've kind of tagged ourselves, which I don't really like to do, but it kind of defines when people are wondering what it is you do. Like we really have this mantra of art, earth, and spirit. And that our art is really inspired by the earth. We have concerns for the earth. We want to work on behalf of the what we can do to bring, how do I say this? I think art enable us to see the artists bring the idea that of the unseen to be seen and to show the world something a little bit different. And maybe there's another pathway that we can do that maybe words couldn't do. So I think that the, the, the art part is that, and the, and the earth inspires that, and I think from our time living in the wilderness. And then the spirit part is something else, and it's not meant as a religious word, but it's, it's meant as connection. I mean, it's a way to connect, and connect through love ultimately, I think. But when we've done those workshops with others, there is a transformation that happens in the process. So we're more encouraged, okay, come try that with us. Experience that for yourself. And then you're part of the society. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, there's something I think that art and creativity brings to truly change, can change the world. So you've conducted uh, workshops like this, mm -hmm. like what you, you two experience. Mm -hmm. How yeah. many times have you done that? Quite oh, a few. my gosh. Well, we started Too doing many. it before we started painting together, actually. Mm -hmm. So we started that probably like in 2001, working with lots of people. But, you know, we also had careers where we worked with lots of creative people. So it was kind of an, e it wasn't, 
it made sense to us that we would just take working with creative people here to working with people. We believe everyone is creative and everyone is a maker. So we just gather up a clump of people who are willing to come to a blank canvas and then make I'll give them something. that space to do that. I think the challenging one, it was interesting, was like we did uh, um, that process that we developed in Palestine. And so we had language barriers and we had a translator. But once the basic translation was done, we did it in India too. We, and once the basic translation was done, boy, it was a universal language. Everybody knew what to do. Everybody just jumped in and started painting together and they understood how it flowed. They could look at it at the end and realize that there was something bigger than themselves. So when, I when think was cool. the Palestine um, That was right before, before Holden, so like 2014. 14. And India was about 14. 14 as well, yeah. Yeah, we have friends, it's 13, sorry. 14 in that, that and maybe Jim asked this, a related question is, you continue your solo practices as well. Mm -hmm. And what percentage time, you know, of clock time, of living time, do you spend in each of these two domains? Not very much in the separate time. I would say no, an I'm, hour maybe. Yeah, I do my, yeah, you do. You, you've done some cool wrapped rocks. We do, stuff, yeah. We. We, that's sort of the side act, yeah. the side show. Like so. I had the practice I was talking about, like what, do, what color do I feel like today thing since January? That's really pretty simple usually. When I'm, only when I have an argument with myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think most of our time is really spent together. And that doesn't always mean making. I mean, I think you live a creative life. We live a creative life so that when we go into the studio, we don't always paint, but there's something that happens anyway. We'll talk about the paintings or what did that feel like? Or what about that workshop on Friday? What was up with that person on that? What do you think we could do better, right? So I think there's, there's a whole creative life around. Our whole life hinges around making stuff. <laughs> so. yeah. Thank you. Sure, You're thank welcome. you. So I was just gonna ask that you have done these groups have you stayed in contact with, I'm thinking, I just watched Dairy Girls, so I'm thinking about like with Ireland. Have you stayed in contact with those people? Are those all of a sudden people who did not speak to each other before? In Palestine and Israel would be another one too. Are they communicating still with one another after experiencing that art group hmm. that you? Yeah, I wouldn't say that we were responsible for that. But yes, we, especially um, Belfast, because we would go, we went every year for 12 or 13 mm -hmm. years. And so we have lots of friends. Um, the pandemic does not help any of that, uh, but it, it, we, they are connected and we still do work with them. But there was, there's also like, we are one of lots of people who do work, right? You know, somebody has to get people to put down their weapons mm -hmm. before they can pick up a paintbrush. So we're, you know, we're yeah. not really solving a lot of problems there, but we are offering whatever bridges that we can, I hope. Yeah, I think it's one little piece, right? Because if the real work goes on there, we're not, Americans hovering in to make it all good. It's crazy. Um, but I think we could help them and give what we could give. And there are lots of people that are incredibly creative over in Northern Ireland, like from making oh puppets gosh. and shows and music and sculpture and, and poetry the murals and have totally yeah. taken a new um, turn for them. Um, but I think all that infusion, we call it, we were just, we went over there just to be present. I think that was the best way to describe it. We were just present for them. Here's what we do, and who wants to play? And that was it. We, we didn't solve world peace problems or anything like that, so. No, I'm just thinking more in the idea like it was the alternative conversation, that if those are still, that's oh. still going on. 
I would venture to say yes. We are certainly close. In fact, we've just had contact with three of our friends recently from Belfast. Um, so we're still close to many of them. And if you've ever been to Ireland and know the Irish, they, they love you forever once you meet them. So there's a, a strong connection. The groups continue, I think, to work very hard. Does it always work? No. But I think there's enough uh, threads in place to kind of keep people sewn together over there. And fortunately, we were involved in groups there that that was their primary focus. We just became a little bit, a little part to that. So it's helpful. It's all creativity is helpful for everything. If you don't, if you don't use it, it comes out in destructive ways. If you can't find a way to use it productively, it always comes out in a negative way. Peg, Chuck, thank you so much for sharing your work with our thank community. You. Thanks wow. for having us. Jim, thanks for everything that you've done and the beautiful show. This is like a tremendous show, Blair and everybody. And we love the way you hung it. All the people who hung thank this you. show. You're out there. We see I you. I know. It was thank beautiful. You so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We were speaking with Peg Carlson Hoffman and Chuck Hoffman about their exhibition at the Edges of Wilderness on view now through June 17th, 2023. Hopkins Center for the Arts. Thanks. You're good. Thanks, everybody.